Greetings, dear church. <laughs> Hope we still have a little bit of strength left. We'll, we're going to be opening the Bible and studying together, see what the Lord has to say for us this evening. So please, whoever has their Bibles, let's open to the letter of Philippians. We are now in the second chapter. We've been going through this verse by verse slowly, but we finally got to this interesting section where Apostle Paul begins a new topic, topic talking about unity. So Apostle Paul has a very positive feeling towards the church of Philippians. He talks a lot about the, the participation in the gospel this church had, about how he longs for the affection of Christ and about their generosity and their prayerfulness. So this is a very positive letter. And when we get to the second chapter, we see here he starts talking about unity, how important it is to be united for Christ. In fact, he actually mentioned this topic in the first chapter in verse 27 when he started talking about only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affections that you stand fast in the spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in the verse that we will study today, he kind of breaks down what it means to be uh, walking in unity and how we can have this unity. He breaks it down and gives us an outline which we can follow together. Now this church did not have many doctrinal errors because Apostle Paul doesn't correct them uh, theologically, but he, there was this problem of disunity and conflict uh, among the members which he had to address. So let, let's read verses uh, chapter 2 verse 1 through 4 so here the apostle paul writes therefore if there is any consolation in christ if any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So see, here we see how Apostle Paul talks about unity, that there is something we have to do, something we have to be, become first, and we have to see that Christ did it all for us already. But one thing I would like to notice is that unity is not the most important thing. We can't say, let's just be united regardless of doctrine. Let's be united regardless of what somebody else believes about Christ. That's not what Apostle Paul is calling us to here. There's a very big movement in, in our times of just uh, the New Age kind of philosophy. Let, let's just all get along. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Buddhist, if you're whatever you believe, we all believe in one thing, and let's just be united. Let's, let's get together. Let's have a potluck. That's not the kind of unity Apostle Paul is talking about. We should never sacrifice doctrine for the sake of unity. Doctrine, if, if doctrine is in the right place, then unity will take place. So in this section, we'll look at three things that Apostle Paul wants to tell us about unity. First, we'll see why we should be, why we should have unity, what does unity look like, and how can we actually attain this unity, what we have to do to have unity among the church. So the first thing, let's look at this question together. Why we should have unity through humility. Unity through humility. Why? And here in verse 1 that we read already, he kind of gives us an outline of why. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Let's notice first the word therefore. He ties into what we talked about before. He ties it into the when he mentioned unity before in, in verse 27 and a few other places. And then he says, if there is any consolation. So he, the word if doesn't mean there, there might be consolation or maybe not. He's not saying it in such a way where we can guess maybe there is comfort and encouragement in Christ or maybe there isn't. The way the Greek is, is, is um, 
stated, it, it's better to even understand it to say, since, since there is consolation in Christ, since there is comfort of love, or because there is consolation or comfort in Christ. The word consolation can also be encouragement. And in other places, Apostle Paul also gives us this kind of language when he says to the Galatians, if you are in Christ, then this will happen. So we know that there's a lot of uh, encouragement in Christ because of what Christ has already done for us in the past, what he's doing for us now, and what he promises us in the future. And he builds upon this, so we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go. So there's four things here. First is the encouragement in Christ. The second reason why we should have unity through humility is because of the comfort of love. Comfort of love. Since we already know this love, shouldn't we seek to give it to others? That's, the, that's what makes uh, for unity in the church. Because we have this close relationship with Christ who gives us uh, this, this love, the, the demonstration of love, and we should give it to others. And the way uh, Apostle Paul does not really expound on this uh, in this letter, how, what we need to do, but if we look at other writings of Paul, he gives us a lot of details of what it means to have the comfort of love. And if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, he breaks down this, what did this mean, the comfort of love? 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So a lot of times he uses the word comfort here, but why could we, like the last section we read, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. If God is our comfort, then we should give it to others. And that's what gives unity in the church. We have to realize that this is all the things that God did for us. It's not something we have to do ourselves. And the next thing he writes about here is the fellowship of the Spirit. The fellowship of the Spirit, the word here he uses is koinonia, the, close, the closest kind of fellowship you can have in the church fellowship with the spirit and we know that the spirit is the source of unity in the church we are we have been baptized into the christ in christ and have received the holy spirit and in the morning the pastor even mentioned this uh when when the pastor prays and close the closes the service oftentimes they quote this um, verse from second corinthians they say the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The communion of the Holy Spirit. We get this blessing every time we walk out of the door. We hear this because we have fellowship, with communion with the Holy Spirit. And that is the only reason we can have unity together with the church and, through, and with the Spirit. The Spirit has given us so much things. He's given us regeneration. He's given us sanctification. He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. So when we are when we have when there's disunity in the church, this we we grieve the Holy Spirit. Disunity is a disobedience to the Holy Spirit when there's fights and quarrels amongst uh, amongst us. And the last thing here he points up, talks about is the affection and mercy. Why we should have unity through humility is because of the affection and mercy. And the word he uses here. If you have a King James version, he uses the word bowels or the deep uh, feeling you get in, inside your stomach. Maybe we had this situation where something really bad happened to us, maybe an accident, something else, and we, we get really sick to our stomach. We get this feeling, uh, this pain. We do not want to eat. We don't want to do anything. It's just a deep feeling. And the, the Hebrews, they often associated the feelings with their stomach. And this is what it means, this affection. This close affection that we have. And Apostle Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 8 of the same letter, he says, talking about affection, he also says, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So here we see a connection. So first Christ gave us the affection. He loved us. He gave us this uh, closeness as we read the affection and mercy. And then because 
Paul experienced this love then and this mercy, then he was able to share it to the church, and this is how unity can take place. We know that God is so full of mercy, and he, he gives us much more mercy than we deserve. And we read in Ephesians where it says there, but God is rich in mercy. He has so much mercy that he wants to give us, but a lot of times we are not able to accept it because we trust uh, ourselves. We do not want to be hum humble before the Lord. We do not want to walk in humility and walk in unity with Christ. So the first thing we looked at is why. Why should we have um, unity through humility? And then in the next verse, he talks about what. What does unity through humility look like in verse 2? Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So again, he states four, uh, four things that we should look for when it says, what does, humility, what does unity look like? And the first thing he mentions is being like-minded. Being like-minded. This is a very, very important topic in, in this letter because he writes about the mind a lot. And this morning, our pastor, and, and when we were having the brother's prayer in the morning, the pastor emphasized how important it is to, to focus on what we think, what comes in our mind, focus on the good things that are from the word of God. Because whatever we think about is what we become. So here he says, being like-minded, being like-minded, or else, or in other words, thinking the same thing or thinking alike. So Paul writes about this in another letter when he writes to the Corinthians. He talks a little bit more about in depth about what it means to be like-minded. Let's look at it together. It's 1 Corinthians 1.10. Like I said, Apostle Paul, in this letter of Philippians, he doesn't really expound on what he means, but in other writings, he, he gives much more details. And this is one of those examples. 1 Corinthians 1.10, he says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So we see here five characteristics about unity. Again, he says, speak the same thing, let there be no divisions, perfectly joined together, same mind and same judgment. Apostle Paul says how important it is to be like-minded, to think the same way. Unity comes when believers think alike. And this is not just doctrinal. I, I believe if we had a survey and we asked everybody about the doctrines of what we believe, the doctrines of, of, of our faith, we would all agree that they are correct and we would say, yes, we believe them. But this is a little bit more. This is more relational, thinking alike relationally, having the right motives not not judging people for what they think because we do not know what people think we can only judge actions but we cannot we should never judge people's motivations what they do uh, what, what they think because we have to focus on on what Christ has already done for us because we have the mind of Christ and also, Apostle Paul says, to set our mind on things above. That's what, when we focus on the things that Christ has done for us, that's when we can uh, focus on, but then we can have like-mindedness. Now, if there's a few people that, if there's conflict between two people, there, oftentimes it's because one person is thinking in the spirit and one is thinking in the flesh. One is thinking about the things of the world and one is thinking about the things of the flesh. And there's always going to be disunity. So the only way when there can be unity is if both people are thinking about the things of the Spirit. Then we could have the true unity. The unity that gives us this like-mindedness. And we know that there is no disunity in, in God, in the Trinity. There is no disunity in between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They are all united and they are a perfect example of how we should also be united. So the first thing is being like-minded. So what does unity look, through humility look like? The second th thing is having the same love. So here again, he's talking about love. The love that Christ showed us is what should compel us to, uh, 
have unity and be like Christ. So being like-minded is what the overflow of that is having the same love. When we have the same love, we will love one another with that kind of love that Christ showed us. Our love for one another will be of the same kind, the sincere kind of love, the love from a pure heart. And that's why Apostle Paul talks a lot about not being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Because one of the unbeliever will always be thinking about what's of the flesh or of the earth, and the believer will be thinking about the, uh, the spirit and what's, uh, what heavenly things. And there will always be this unity. So Apostle Paul says we should be united, especially when it comes to picking your spouse, picking your wife for your future. Always pick a, a wife that has the same mind, the same love, so you can share this unity together. And the next thing he talks about is one accord, being in one accord. Now, we, we just heard the guitar playing with the piano playing. It's, it's tuned to the right chord. Sometimes when I play my guitar and I haven't played for a while and I accidentally strum the wrong chord, and you can tell there's right away, if you, if you just play one wrong note, there's a discord. There's a, you, it doesn't have harmony. So you correct your fingers and you play the right chord, and it sounds so beautiful. And that's what it means here to be of this one in harmony one with each other. Being in harmony is what will give us unity with each other. So if everyone has the desire to, if, if everyone has the desire to serve Christ, there will be unity. But if, if there is somebody who has a desire to serve himself, there will be disunity. And the last thing here is being of one mind. It seems like Apostle Paul already talked about the mind. In the previous verse, he said, if anyone, if fellowship of the Spirit, any affection, and then he says, um, if there's be any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, and he talks about the mind. In verse 2, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, and then again he says, the same word of one mind. So this is a very important topic to Apostle Paul, to have the right mind, mindset, to think about what glorifies God. And some versions have this uh, second usage of the word mind as intent on one purpose, to be purposed on what glorifies God. And we know that people are all controlled by the deep desires of the word of God when we think of the things that uh, glorify God not only working outwardly, but inwardly having the same purpose and the same intention. So unity is evident when everybody loves one another. And the last thing before we pray, how can we attain this unity? How can we attain unity through humility? When we read this section, Apostle Paul talks about two topics interchangeably. He talks about unity, but that unity is impossible without humility. We can never have unity unless there's humility, unless people are counting others above, better than themselves, above, more important than others, that more, counting others more important than ourselves. Again, he gives us four, four things that we should focus on. A, a, a few of them are negative and a few of them are positive. So the first thing he says, do, not, do nothing from selfishness or Conceit. So let's read verse 3 and 4 again. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So here he says, do nothing from selfishness. And we know that selfishness is the sin that destroys unity the most. We can never have unity when people are always seeking their own. As soon as we become selfish, we become at war with uh, everybody around us because if we want our own uh, things for ourselves, then we know that the other person, if they want something, they will fight us or we will fight them because we want ourself, uh, what's better for ourselves. So first, he gives us this negative thing to think about what we should not have because this will never uh, lead to unity. Possessing these attitudes will never allow unity to abide. 
And pride is that may, what makes, that pushes away this uh, desire. Um, when we have pride, we will never be able to have unity and to serve others. And the next thing he says is the lowliness of mind. The lowliness of mind. So here in verse 3, the end, he says, let, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Once again, we see the, the topic of mind. How important is what we allow to come into our mind because that is what will control how we react to others, well, whether we treat others with respect or whether we judge them before we even know what a person uh, is thinking. So unity is born out of humility, and humility should be easy to maintain if we remember, if we remember our, our own faults. Now, Apostle Paul was a good example of humility. If we look at Apostle Paul now from history, we, we might say, wow, what a great and awesome man of God. How much scriptures he wrote. He was so powerful, so influential in history. He's said to be the second most influential person after Christ, just so powerful of a person. But when we look at, at how he describes himself, we see how humble he is, how he considers himself nothing. He says, I am the chief of sinners. Why is this? Uh, how could a man so... High, we think of him so highly, but he thought so lowly of himself. And this gives us a clue to what humility really is, because Apostle Paul did not know anybody else's heart. He only knew his own heart, and he knew what wickedness had, comes out of his heart, because he didn't, nobody else could know his heart, and nobody knows my heart. That's why we should not judge others, others people's motives, but we should to seek to be humble before before Christ. So from Paul's perspective, he was the lowest sinner because he says, I'm not even worthy to be an apostle. From his perspective, he was the worst of sinners because he only knew himself. And that's, uh, that gives us an idea of how we should look at ourselves because we do not know of what other people are thinking. And next we see that what attitude we should have to have unity through humility is to not look out for your own interest, but look out for the interest of others. To care for those around us is what God wants us to do. And we know the golden rule where Jesus, uh, God in the Old Testament, and Jesus repeats this, says, love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and your neighbor as yourself. So the only way to love your neighbor as yourself is when we have a right relationship with God in the first place. And I would like to end with one last reference from one of the writings of Apostle Paul in Romans 12.9. Romans 12.9 gives us an idea of how important it is to give preference to others. And he writes about this once again in a little bit more detail to the letters of Romans. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving, giving preference to one another. Giving preference to one another. That really is what humility is and what not looking out for your own interest is when we see that, yes, we have to do, take care of ourselves, but there are those around us that need, need to be cared for also. And we see this um, in our church. We, just today, an example, how, how much people had to prepare everything. We had the baking sale, the, the plov sale, the, the Lipyorski sale. All this took so much effort on people. And we just came and we donated. We took it. But a lot of people spent a whole day yesterday preparing, the whole day today in, in the morning. They gave them the, of themselves for the benefit of others because this money will be donated to different needs in Moldova and different places. This is a good example of how we should to seek the benefit of others, to give preference to one another. And the last thing is, but also be concerned with the interests of others. And we see that self selfishness kills this ability for unity. We can't have unity if we have selfish ambitions. 
It is the mind of the spiritual maturity and what was the mind of Christ. We know that Christ is the perfect example of what humility is, and we would never be able to read this and say, okay, I will try to follow this unless we, we read the next verses in chapter 5. We will not look at the verse 5 through 11, but when, next time when we get there, this will be the very important topic of the humiliation of Christ, what he went through when he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This mind or this attitude or the Russian word is uh, feelings or the chustvavanya, the feelings that Christ experienced when he, was, when he humbled himself. And what we have to humble ourselves is nothing compared to what Christ humbled himself when he came. He gave up everything. And he gave us this perfect example, this model to follow. So the only way this whole unity in the church can work is when we realize that Christ went ahead of us and he showed us this perfect example. So Christ is our model. He gave of himself. He emptied he did not have vain glory like it says here, or conceit. He gave of himself so that others, so that he can attain us, so that we can serve Christ. And this is the high standard he set, and we can't attain this unless, like it says in verse 1, we first have a relationship with Christ. We have the love, comfort of love and the fellowship of the Spirit and the affection and the mercy of God. If we accept it to ourselves, then we can serve others in humility. So let, a, let us pray together and ask that the Lord will bless us and to follow this word and to be lowly of mind and to serve others. Amen. Let's pray.